Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to help support the show by becoming a premium member, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash podcast to sign up. Memberships are only $2.99 a month. By becoming a premium member, you'll be able to download episodes onto your mobile device and listen to them commercial-free wherever you go. Also, if you'd like to check out the new Dogman Encounters t-shirt store, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash store and take a look around. Buying a t-shirt or sweatshirt there is another great way to help support the show. As always, thanks for listening. Alright, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Brandon Close. Brandon, welcome to the show. How are you doing, Vic? Thanks for having me. Oh, you know you're welcome. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm uh, 30 years old. I've got uh, my wife and my daughter. Just go to work, come back home, do the family thing, and I do enjoy very much going into the woods and being able to enjoy the outdoors, being able to have respect for the animal, as well as, you know, any type of fishing and hunting, I really enjoy. I like to be able to create memories with my family that way. And I think that it's a good experience for all of us to be able to get outdoors and and be able to actually smell the trees and smell the fresh air and see the other animals and see what they're doing and be able to create a bond and a relationship with nature all together. And I definitely have had quite a change with that recently, but my schedule on a weekly basis is usually pretty much the same. I get up, I help make breakfast, I kiss my family goodbye and go to work and come home and try to unwind at that point in my free time basically is just made up of being in the outdoors and being able to enjoy it. Yeah, it's just a shame you can't enjoy the outdoors the way you used to before you had that encounter we're going to talk about tonight. Yes. Because of how traumatic your encounter was, you sought professional help to try to recover from it. Did that help you as much as you thought it would? After seeing what I had seen, I was unsure as to where it is that I need to go, being that it's not exactly something you hear every day. And at first I said, well, I think I'm going to explain this to a couple of close friends. And regardless of what people's perspective of me are, I've spent a lot of time trying to be able to have everyone understand that I'm honest and I'm straightforward with things. So to tell people how much of an emotionally distraught encounter this was and not have the respect or belief from everyone to get in return, I I thought that it would be best for me to, other than being ridiculed and mocked by people that I've built these relationships with over the past 31 years, I went and I've got professional help. Now, over the past month, I've done so. And even from them, their professional perspective is to basically sit and listen. And still knowing in the back of my head that I know that this counselor, this therapist, doesn't believe a word that I'm saying. I think she believes that I believe that it happened. And it didn't really do anything for me. I was not able to express myself. I I had expressed myself, but I had not, I hadn't received the input back that I was expecting that I would get help for. I guess what I'm trying to say is no, I, I didn't get any help from spending money on someone to listen to my problems. And, uh, I would have hoped to have got something a little bit different in return from them, being that I paid money for it. It didn't make me feel any better. I felt now, other than being mocked from close 
friends. Now I have a complete stranger who doesn't believe anything that I'm saying. And um, I stopped going just recently after we had spoke the other day. And the difference in that was I could see that you have a real understanding for these encounters. And to know that someone else believes me, to know that someone else understands what it was that I had went through physically and mentally as well as emotionally because being as emotionally involved in the encounter as I was and I'm sure a lot of other people were it's very difficult to think clearly when you're emotionally involved in a situation not let alone be able to express and relive that encounter again so to be able to do that with somebody who you know isn't listening and isn't on the same page is almost a waste of time and I know a waste of money from personal experience. But after speaking to you the other day, I was able to really get a good grasp for the right way to talk about it. And you had shown a lot of support in being that I know that you do believe me is such a huge difference because when you know that you have a group of individuals or an individual by themselves that is interested in hearing what you're saying, and there's no controversy in truth. They know that this is real, and that means a lot more personally to me because you showed an interest in what it is that I had to say. And when communicating with another human in general, you want to get positive responses. And to just hear, okay, yep, all right, okay, how does that make you feel? You know, that's the stereotypical therapist, and that doesn't really do anything. All she is is someone to vent to, and I didn't get what I needed from her, no. I did get a lot of support from you in different ways to look at the encounter and how to deal with it, and since then, I've been able to sleep better. I've been thinking about these things differently. And it's been a great help to me, and it didn't cost me any money. So I sincerely appreciate that, Vic. Oh, you know you're welcome. I'm just glad that it helped you as much as I hoped it would. How do you find out about me and what I do, Brandon? Well, I originally, after the encounter, as I said, had been in a loss for where to go and who to turn to because the police, they did nothing for me. The therapist did nothing for me. And I still felt I was on my own. So I went online and started looking around in forums to be able to see if there's anybody else that had shared my experience that I'd be able to connect with. And you had to go on and you had to put in a name, password, and log in and create an account. And it was just frustrating. And I wanted to connect with someone that understood where I was coming from because it's easier to build a relationship with somebody that has a similar experience that can relate and identify with what it is that you went through. And just that alone builds a stronger bond and a higher level of comfortability when being able to discuss the encounter with someone else. And I was a little discouraged in what I found. I did find some people on there, but I luckily found a link that somebody had posted online on a random forum on a website. And I clicked on that, and it was one of your shows. And seeing that it was one of your shows, I had clicked on it, and that's how it had opened me up to what it was that I was able to move forward with today. And I think that that's really what had put me in the right direction, because I didn't know where to go before then. And I started listening to a few of the encounters, and I said, wow. I said, this is really accurate. This is similar to what it is that I had gone through and I started reading comments and I started listening to more encounters and then I was able to talk with you and because you have the knowledge you do in this area, you know how to deal with it much better than a therapist, much better than a random person who doesn't understand where I'm coming from. So you knew the correct way to steer me and uh, you were able to change my perspective on how it was that I was looking at it. Like I said, you know, someone is emotionally involved in a situation or an encounter like this, it's difficult to think clearly. Your head's clouded with emotion. And you were able to have me 
look at something that really wasn't what it was and you were able to kind of change my perspective and put me in a different angle to view the encounter and that was able to help me a lot better and I've definitely been making some leeway. Unfortunately, I'm not able to get back out in the woods just yet, but I think we're on the right path. Well, I'm so glad you're heading in the right direction now. Yeah, it's funny to think that you can be inside the bottle and consequently be inches from the label, but you still can't read it. And like we talked about in our second conversation, it wasn't until you climbed out of the bottle, took a step back, and looked at the big picture that you are able to see what happened for what it really was. In other words, you didn't get away from that dog, man. He let you get away. Once you're able to see what happened for what it really was, that's when the healing process really started. And I'm so glad you're consequently able to deal with this in a healthier way. Before you tell us about your encounter, please tell us about the place where it happened. Well, I live in Cato, New York. It's uh, upstate New York. Very country-type setting. The house is on a road that's about seven miles, eight miles long. Connects two other back roads. It was kind of stone road up until about 15 years ago and they just started recently paving it. There's only about five houses on that street, and it would take about 25 minutes to be able to walk to your neighbor, 30 minutes. It's all surrounded by woods and field. I have 192 acres out there. 50 of them are woods, and the rest of them are cornfields and other uh farmland that I've rented out to the farmers that live in the area in exchange for a quarter cow or a half a pig and money on an annual basis, as well as uh, I can still hunt that land. The house is about 40 feet away from the road, and uh, all around me on the right and left and back side is all pretty thick woods, and uh, across the street is all very thick woods and, and fields. It's very quiet at night, and it would take a long time to be able to get to somebody if someone really needed some help, pretty much out there alone. Oh, it sounds like a really nice property. It's just a shame that you're not able to enjoy it the way you once were able to, now that you know you might have a dogman roaming around there still. All right, Brandon, please tell us about your encounter. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. Well, this was the beginning of February. A few weeks ago, it was February 2nd, 2018, and uh, that was definitely the day that had changed my life. I had got up in the morning and kissed my family goodbye and went to work like I normally do around 5 a.m. I uh, had gotten a few phone calls throughout the day from my wife, and she stays home with our newborn, and I had gotten a few calls from her. And she had said, because we have some cows, some livestock, about 12 of them. And she had called me and she'd been concerned. And she had said, hey, uh, do you know that all of the cows are huddled up in the corner closest to the house, away from the wood line? And they've been there all day. They won't eat. They won't move or anything. And I didn't pay any mind to it. I was really busy at work. And I said, you know, don't worry about it. I'll check it out later. I'm, I'm busy right now. And I just kind of figured, all right, well, maybe, you know, coyotes are out there messing with them again. I'll handle them later on. They are quite a nuisance around where we are. So I just had assumed at the time that that's what it was because that's what I'm familiar with. So I didn't pay any mind to that. And uh, I get another phone call right before I had left work. And uh, it was my wife calling me back. And she had said, I'm not able to let the dog out. Maya won't go outside. I'm having to drag her outside by her collar to go pee. She doesn't want to go out, and uh, I'm not sure what's going on with her. And I said, okay. I said, I'm almost home. You know, I'll deal with it when I get home. Now, I'm thinking that this is pretty strange now because the animals know most of the time a lot more than, you know, we know. And I'm thinking to myself, well, why not the cows all bundled up in the corner there Now the dog won't go outside, you know, what's going on here? So now I'm a little bit concerned, but it's not a big deal at the moment. So I'm pulling up here, and on the left side, the cornfield's there across the street, and 
I just get past the hedgerow where it starts to open up on the right where my lawn is. And we've got about six acres of mowed grass around our house and the rest is fields and woods. And I see the cows and they're scrunched up in like a 20 by 20 foot area in the closest corner of their fenced in plot. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this? And I've never seen them do this before. I mean, they were almost on top of each other, Vic. They were climbing up and trying to get closer and closer, huddled up into the corner. And they had popped the breaker because they kept pushing into the fence, which is an electric fence. And they each had touched it so many times. I'm not sure what had happened, but they didn't care about it. They had actually popped the breaker so there was no electricity running through the fence anymore. It may have popped a line or a wire somewhere. I'm not sure. But I could see that they were scared of something. Something was going on. And at that point, I'm thinking, wow, there must be a big pack out here. I'm going to have to deal with this. So I'm looking at them scrunching them in 12 full-grown cows here in about a 20 by 20 foot circle. And I'm like, okay, definitely coyotes. So I parked and I get out, I get my work stuff and I go to walk inside. I'm walking up the front driveway and it's dusk now. And I'm walking up and I'll tell you, I hear the most deep but raspy, gurgly, almost scream howl. And it literally sent chills down my spine. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. And I thought, what the f*** was that? And I've been in the woods since I was a kid. I've hunted and fished since I was a kid. And I've never heard anything like this. But again, going by what I know, I thought, okay, some type of coyote was attacked or some type of animal out there. Something's going on. Now, although the DEC says there's no mountain lions in our area, I know that there is. So I'm thinking, well, even though I haven't seen a mountain lion, I know that there has been some sightings around the area very rarely. But I figured, well, maybe that's it. But something still is different because I'd even heard them on YouTube, and I know that that wasn't it. So I get inside, and my wife's jabbering a mile a minute about everything she dealt with today. And uh, outside the phone calls that she had told me when I had left in the early morning, she said that she had heard scratching at the window, a real deep scratching noise on the side of the house, not like a branch type of scratch. And I said, what do you mean? I don't understand. And she said, come look at this. So she walks me outside, and I see deep scratches in the siding. There's four lines. The one on the left is the lightest, and then the one to the right of that was pretty deep. The one next to that was very deep. And the one all the way to the right was fairly deep as well. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, what the hell was this? And I'm thinking to myself, what could have done that? And I'm looking around. There's no branches that would have done anything like that. And I said, did you bang into the house with anything? Did you move something up onto the deck? Because I built a big deck that wraps around most of the house. And I said, did you move some of the chairs or, or lawn stuff? And she said, no. She said, I heard this and I had come out a little while after to see it. So I said, okay, I I don't know what this is. And as we're discussing this, and I'm seeing that it's really bad, we hear, as we're walking back in, this howl again, this deep, gurgly type of scream. And it just shook me to my core. And I saw my wife's eyes get huge. We exchanged glances, and I said, did you hear that? And she said, yeah. And I said, what the hell is that? She said to me, I, I'm not sure. And she goes, you would know better than I would. And I said, I have absolutely no clue, honey. I've never heard that noise before. And we can see all the cattle in the corner. Now they're climbing up on top of each other as that noise is being projected towards us. They hear it as well. Now all these cows are jumping on top of each other. They're pushing and pushing and pushing in the corner. They're trying to get out of this fenced-in area. And I'm thinking, oh, God, now I'm going to have to fix this fence. They're going to bust it out. So I'm thinking maybe I should move them until I find out what exactly it is that's going on here. So we walk back into the house, and we're talking about this, and we get back in, and I'm sitting to try to think what I can do about this cattle, because I'm thinking, I don't want to lose all my cattle. So I load my shotgun up, and I call my neighbor, and I say, hey, Gene, I said, come on down. I said, let's go for a ride out back in the buggy. It's like a four-wheeler, razor-type thing. And I said, we'll come down, and We'll see what we can do to take care of some of these coyote because they're a big problem out here. So he comes down. 
I explained to him a little bit about the situation. I said, you know, have you heard this noise at all around here? And he says, no. And I, and I sounded like a fool trying to explain to him that it sounded like a woman that had been smoking 30 cigarettes an hour for the last 65 years. But it was deep and it was raspy and like a woman screaming. It's it's difficult to explain. And, you know, he kind of looks at me like, okay, you know, whatever. So we load up and I tell my wife, I said, we're going out back and we're going to get rid of some of these coyote. And she said, okay. So we go out and what, what I normally do is with the coyote out here, I have a wireless call, which is a speaker box with a wireless remote. And you can hit different calls, which some are, for an example here, a dying rabbit or a squirrel or whatever it may be that brings them in. They hear that and it brings them in. And I have a spotlight that I put a red lens cover over because they can't see the color red. So we load all that stuff up, we throw it in the back, and I'm explaining to them, I said, on the way out, these cows are doing this, they're doing that, and I'm not sure what to do. So we get going down the road, and it's about a, I don't know, probably not even a two-minute ride down, and it's dark out now. We get down a little ways, and the dirt road's on the left, and we go to turn down my dirt road here, and we get turned down the dirt road, and I'm looking at multiple groups of deer literally breaking out of the woods and running towards us. I mean, they're headed across the street. They're coming straight at us. This dirt road is about five to six foot wide. And then on each side of the road, there's about two foot of brush. And then right on the other side of that is the woods on both sides. So. I'm looking, and they're not in the woods. They're right on the edges of the dirt road. And these deer are flying towards us. White flags flying, tails in the air. Something's going on. And they're going by us, maybe 10 feet on each each side of us here. They're not worried about us coming down in the buggy or anything. And I'm thinking to myself, Do you, are you looking at this right now? Can you see this, Gene? And his, just, his mouth kind of hanging open like that's just a strange thing to see them coming right at us. And there was about three or four groups of two to four deer, about 25, 30 feet apart. And they're all just coming, flying at us. And I'm thinking, wow, there must be a big pack out here. We're really going to have to do some work. So we get going down the dirt road, the deer pass us. And I knew something was wrong. So I said, you know, if you see anything before we get down there on the way, I said, shoot what you see. And we get going about a half mile down the road, and I'm doing about 45 now down this dirt trail. And as we're getting in, we're about two miles or so into the woods now. And it's all woods around me. It's dark out. And I hear something smashing like it's some type of rhino in the woods next to us. And I'm just buzzing along, and I'm thinking to myself, we've got no bears or moose in this area. And I said, what the hell is that? So I start to slow down, and I stop. And the buggy is just idling. And I get the worst feeling of my life. Like somebody is watching me. Something is watching me right now. And I'm getting goosebumps everywhere. The hair stands up on the back of my neck. And Gene's voice is real shaky. And he says to me, we need to leave right now. Something's not right. And it is dead quiet. There's no sound. No animals. No nothing. And I kind of trying to keep my cool, even though I feel it too. And it's intense, Vic. It's intense. And I said, don't get all scary on me here. We got firearms. Just relax. You know, thinking to myself, there's nothing in the woods here that I haven't seen in the past 30 years. No way. So we sit for another maybe 20 seconds. And I shut the buggy off now. So there's no more idle. And I hear this heavy, heavy breathing. The trail is about roadside, like I said, wood line on about six to eight feet of each side of us. And we're sitting about two miles in the woods now, complete darkness, just the lights on in front of the buggy. And I said, dude, do you hear that? And I reached over with my spotlight and I pull it up. I pull the red lens cover off. And as I go over to shine this and I said, point your gun over here. And he's got it up. Now, what I'm about to tell you here is is 
where everybody has put me down and I feel has ruined my reputation for being honest and true in every sense. But that doesn't embarrass me because we know what we saw. Now, I pulled that spotlight out thick and I scanned the first few feet heading into the woods. And I got to the general area where I heard that breathing. Now, this is a million candlelight spotlight. And, uh, it's, it's very bright. It's got like an eight or ten inch head on it. And it's got the trigger on it. You hold up and I get to the general, general area where I had heard that heavy breathing. And I look in and I see some type of hairy animal. And I could see that it's got its arm around a tree a little bit. And I'm thinking to myself, whoa, what the hell is that? And its head on the back looked like I could see ears, pointy ears, that looked like some type of daggers about 8 inches, maybe 10 inches on the top of its head. And as I am shining the light, I, I hit the top and I, I see like this, whatever this thing is, it turns and steps away a little bit from the tree. And I can't believe what I'm seeing. This thing had a snout like the most stereotypical werewolf. That's all I thought. This is a werewolf. But my brain isn't working properly because I'm thinking to myself, this isn't real. There's no way that I'm I'm seeing this creature here. This looks like if you've ever seen the movie Van Helsing, it looks like that exact werewolf, almost 98% similar. Okay, and now I can hear my heartbeat in my ears. It is all quiet around us, other than this breathing from this creature I'm looking at, and I am just completely shook to my core. I've never seen anything like this in my life. This isn't supposed to be real. This isn't a real creature. There's no way that I'm looking at this. I'm staring at this thing, not knowing how much time has gone by. And it turns a little more, and I see its eyes. Now, its eyes were like a bright... If you held a corona up to the sunlight, that's what this thing's eyes looked like. Like a goldish amber color. And it turns, and I see it, its snout. It looks like a dog snout, but it's got a massive head. And I'm talking, I can see its its arm a little bit, but just its its hand. And I'm I'm trying to rack through my brain, and I'm seeing all of these things kind of at once, and, and they're not making any sense to me. It's got a huge head. The hair on it is is like this short kind of. It's not shaggy. I can almost see its skin uh, underneath. But I, I'm noticing that this thing's got bright gold eyes, pointy dog ears, and a and a a snout like a like some type of canine creature. That's when I am trying to process all this, and it seemed like 20 minutes. I don't know exactly how long it was, but all of a sudden Gene screamed real loud. And that scared me even more. And at that point, that broke the silence. And this thing stepped away from the tree it was up against. And I couldn't believe what I saw. This thing, it was making some type of cracking noise. Like if you had 15, 20 people together cracking their knuckles, in a microphone on a loudspeaker and bones were breaking inside of somebody's body. This thing stands up on two legs, Vic. Its back legs, it has haunches like a dog. Okay. This thing is almost eight foot, nine foot tall. This thing is so big at 15, maybe 18 feet away. I could see this thing clear as day. There is no question. My spotlight is on this thing, and it's fully charged, brighter than ever. I just, I couldn't believe what I'm seeing. Its chest looked like some type of world record bodybuilder. This thing was jacked. 
its arms from the shoulder to the elbow looked like a normal length, but the length from the elbow to the wrist were extra long, almost twice as long as the top part. It had hands, Vic. This thing had five fingers with nails on them, sharp nails that looked like black knives on the tip of its fingers, a couple inches long. It just had these big hands. And I, it's not processing with me. I didn't understand what it is that I'm looking at here. I can see it's jacked. It's massive chest, huge arms. I mean, ripped. It's got abs like some 30-year-old at a gym. Its waist seemed to be fitting, I guess you could say. It was smaller. And its legs were pretty jacked, but they were skinny. And it had its legs bent backwards like a dog. But I'm so confused. I'm looking at the werewolf thing, and it's standing up on two legs. There's no way. There's absolutely no way. And the cracking sound that I'm hearing when this thing stood all the way up, I, I didn't understand what's making that noise. And I know it wasn't branches breaking because I heard the branches breaking on the way down. And as this thing is breathing heavily, which I'm assuming it's breathing heavily because of it keeping up with us in the woods at 40 miles an hour, going down next to us, just smashing through things. And I'm not talking twigs and, and sticks here. The, these are big branches. This thing is just barreling through. So he screams, I'm taking the inventory of what it is that I'm looking at here, and I am just completely blown away. The most fearful I have ever been in my entire life. It just, I, I thought I'm in a nightmare. I tried to close my eyes and shake my head and wake up, and, and it was still there. It was real. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what's my next move? There's no way that this is happening. I can't understand or fathom or process what this creature is that I'm looking at. So Gene screams, I'm looking at this thing. And at that point, I, I didn't even know what to do. I was stuck. So it stands up, and I see its arms hanging down in front of it, and it, I just didn't know what to do at that point. And the only thing that broke the silence at that point was that scream, and Gene fires three shots in a row at this thing. Now, this is a Remington 875 shot pump, okay? High brass slugs. He's shooting out of this thing at 15 to 18 feet away. He fires the first one. And at this point, my ears are ringing because he's right next to me. We're in somewhat of an enclosed vehicle. But I got the spotlight on this creature still. And I see the first bullet hit its chest. It rips the whole right side pectoral muscle almost off of this thing. I can see it rip the skin. I can see the blood. This thing is real. It it is a creature. It does bleed. I could see that the whole right pectoral muscle was completely almost torn off of its body. Pieces were hanging down. And this thing lets out a scream. And at that point, he had fired two more shots right away afterwards. But this thing was fast, Vic. This thing was real fast. So the three shots in a row, after the first bullet hits his chest and rips the skin and the pectoral muscle, this thing jumped. Okay? no exaggeration. This thing jumped clear 15 feet up into the tree, okay, and almost 30 feet across the dirt road into the other side of the woods. As it goes across, okay, I can see from what little moonlight that we have. Now, the buggy lights are on in the front, but I couldn't, I didn't move my spotlight with the creature because he did it so fast. But as it gets and jumps across the, the way here, right in front of us, I can get a good look at this thing all the way compared to other things around it now. And I see that this is a dog head with a bodybuilder's chest, arms. I mean, this thing is, is huge. It's eight or nine foot plus now that I can compare it to the things around it. I just, I couldn't believe it. It looked, it looked pretend. It looked like, um, I, I can't even explain. I'm so terrified at this point. I didn't know what to do, but the shotgun and him jumping completely broke me out of this trance that I was in of 
being a complete fool and sitting there not knowing what to do next. So I start the buggy up. I crank the wheels all the way to the left. The back tires are spinning, throwing dirt behind me. This thing is to the floor. I get it spun right around, and I'm headed to the road. And I'm screaming to Gene, what the was that? And he's screaming, my gun's jammed, my gun's jammed. And I'm looking over at the shotgun, and I'm looking forward, looking over at the shotgun, looking forward, and I'm screaming at him to hurry up, hurry up, get it loaded, get it loaded. I don't know where this thing is. I don't know when it's coming back. I'm trying to reach down for my pistol. And I'm reaching, but it's bouncing around on the floor somewhere because this dirt road's got little stones in it and it's bumps and the water knocks out out of a bunch of the dirt. So there's divots everywhere. There's mud holes and you get down into there. And we're two miles. We're two miles into the woods now. And it's dark. There's nothing else around us. We are, and in my perspective, we're a long way from home. And the gun that he has next to him is jammed. And I'm not sure what our next move is. The only thing I could do was keep my foot on that gas. I see Gene look up and he looks by me. Man. I look to the left side where he's looking out my window on the driver's side. And I'm doing about 50 at this point, Vic. I look out the left-hand side next to us, about two foot next to me. I see this creature. It's running right next to us. This thing is on two legs, running directly next to us, on its back haunches like a dog. Its arms are hanging in front of it like it's going to tackle something, like it's about to fall. But it's got its arms in front of us hanging down, and it's running next to me. I can hear its feet hitting the ground, even with this vehicle that we're in to the floor. I can hear it boom, 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 just taking big strides right next to us. And it's got its head down a little ways. Now, this buggy is about five and a half foot tall. This thing is hunched over, almost leaning forward like it's going to fall. But it wasn't. I can see now all the little teeny creases of its muscles that are in its body, on its body. I could see the hairs were blackish gray, and they were thin enough to be able to see that it did have skin underneath. And this thing was so ripped. I see its abs contracting and getting loose again as it breathes running next to me. I can see its muscles get tight in its legs because they're right where my face is. I look out and look back. And I am completely terrified at this point. I don't, I can't even make a sound. I can't scream or, or even, I can't get any words out. I don't, I can't believe that this thing's running next to us at a full sprint. I mean, I, I don't personally know if it was at a full sprint, but I had this thing to the floor and it was standing right next to us, leaning down, looking into the window. I see its eyes. And again, there are these amber colored looking eyes and I was I was more terrified than I could ever dream of in my life and I'm trying to get this thing moving as quick as possible Gene's just and Gene's staring at this thing and all the color drained right out of his face I'm sure mine did as well and I'm I'm just looking forward looking over I'm hoping that he loads this thing up I've got one arm on the steering wheel and one hand down now trying to find what it is that's going on, and I crank the wheel to the right to try to move further away from this thing. Vic, this thing puts its arm out. Now I can see its hand, clear daylight, so to speak, with the front two lights of the buggy shining straight on this thing. Its hand is massive. It has five fingers and these black, long, sharp nails. It's got its hand, puts it right on the driver's side light. And I feel the buggy starting to slow down. And I'm thinking to myself, no way. This thing had the intelligence to put its hand in front of the vehicle, put it on the vehicle I was in, and put its hand on the light. And I remember looking forward, and I could see the light completely cut off the whole left side of the trail because the only thing that we've got for light right now is the two front lights pointing forward, and it is dark as hell. So I see this hand in front of me holding its back. I feel the buggy slowing down. And I look back over at him. And as I can see it, he's looking in. And I see his teeth. 
they are so sharp, unlike dogs that would be rounded at the end. These are sharp. And I'm talking serious sharp. I can hear them. He's chomping down repetitively. Boom, 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 boom. And I can see that every time he chomps down, I can hear it next to me. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm looking over at him, looking forward, looking over, looking forward. He's got his hand on the front. This vehicle's slowing down. I got it all the way to the floor. I could feel the vehicle slow, and I could hear the weight and the strain on the motor as I'm trying to push forward. This thing's maybe 150 horsepower. It's not much, but I can feel it slowing down, and I'm getting real scared now. And I see this thing, and I, this sounds this sounds insane. This creature, as it's looking inside of the vehicle with its hand on my vehicle, both of us are in there. Slowing down, I thought, this is it. We're done. It smiles. Its lips curl up on the sides, and it smiles. And I am just in complete fear, shook to my core. I have absolutely no clue what to do. I felt like it had taken everything from me that I've ever known to be good and true, and it had completely smashed it to the ground. This thing's aura. Its whole demeanor, it was just the most evil thing I've ever felt in my life. It projected this level of being emotionally distraught and just completely terrified, worse than if it was the end of the world or you'd lost your entire family or or anything. It was, I don't understand how it was able to make me feel that way. But it was beyond fright. It was beyond being terrified. It completely drained my soul. This thing was beyond evil. And I see this smile. And, I mean, at this point, there's nothing I'm not going to believe because I'm where I am right now. Everything starts flashing through my head. This is the end of my life. I have memories that I want to create with my family. What about the last person that I argued with? I <laughs> I didn't get to even apologize to them. I don't want to end like this. I have goals that I want to achieve. I want to try to be the best version of myself. And I have character flaws, as everyone else does, that I need to work on. I have things that I regret, that I wish I would have done differently, experiences that I wish I would have taken advantage of. And I'm thinking to myself, my whole life is literally flashing in my head, boom, 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 different things. And when they say your life flashes before your eyes, it really does. And I wasn't able to even do anything. It's just I'm looking forward, trying to drive, looking at this creature, and I didn't know what else I was supposed to do. I'm thinking about my baby girl, and I'm thinking about my wife, and what what's going to happen? How are they going to find me? How are they going to provide? Uh, my my daughter and my wife have to grow up without anybody around. What's the story that's going to be told? Accident in the woods? Vehicle accident? I know it's not going to say huge freaking wolf man attacks guys in woods. We both know it's not going to say that. So I'm racking my brain here and I am completely distraught. And all of a sudden, I hear, boom! And at the same time, I see Gene has the shotgun pointed in front of my face. Now, we're sitting side by side, going forward towards the road in the woods. He reaches to his left and points the gun. The barrel's directly in front of me, but I'm looking forward. So it's about to shoot to the left where this creature is. And as soon as he pulled it up, I see this thing disappear out from next to me, and he still fires, but he had missed it. My ears are ringing. I see this thing. He's gone. How does this creature have the intelligence to be able to completely stop? That it saw that that gun was pulled up. It knows what it did to it. I could see it ripped up, its chest ripped up again when it was running next to us. It knows what the consequences are from the end of that barrel. Because just prior, it had felt that. It knows. And when that firearm got held up, 
this thing let go of the front of the vehicle. I felt the strain and the load be taken off the motor. We speed back up, and this thing's gone. And I'm like, wow, how did it realize that that's what was going on? Now, I don't know how much time had gone by. It felt like about two hours. So now as we're getting down the road, I'm thinking to myself, this thing's just smirked at me like an almost taunting type of deal. It was about to stop our buggy completely. And it reaches out with man's hands with claws. I mean, what is all this? I'm, 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 I'm out of control trying to think of everything, but I'm glad that it's not next to me anymore. But I'm still terrified because I have no clue where this thing is. I hear it now crashing into the woods next to us again. The same sound I heard as we were coming in. And this thing is just boom, 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 blasting through all these woods next to us, through branches, through everything. I, I just like, okay, next time he comes in, we're going to get hit and we're going to get hit hard. And all I could do is keep it to the floor, but it stays in the woods over there for the next maybe 12 seconds. It didn't come back out yet. And I'm like, we're, dude, we're not going to make it to the road. And all I'm saying to Gene is, when that thing comes back out, hit it again, hit it again, hit it again. And he's got a gun out the window, aiming it out there. I'm driving forward, and we hit the road. It seemed like it was forever, but we finally hit the road. I didn't slow down. I hit that road. I cranked the wheel all the way to the right. The back tires slid off the gravel and onto the road. Tires are are squealing. And then I see it. It tried to flank us. It tried to jump out right there at the edge of the woods and cut us off. Or so I thought that's what it tried to do. But I get to turning, I slid, we lost speed sliding onto the road, but I still got it to the floor. Gene, I can feel him lean over onto me because of the G-force from, from turning it at 40 miles an hour, you know, skidding onto the road. This thing jumps clear, easy, another 20, 25 foot out of the woods onto the side of the road where the ditch is, and now it's behind us. And we're going down the road, and Gene's got the gun pointed back to it. And he's not he's not shooting anymore, though. And as soon as he gets the gun pointed, when we straighten the vehicle out, he's got the firearm pointed down back behind us where this thing's standing. And it kind of leans down a little bit, and I see it go back down on all fours. And it's sitting there. It lets out this huge roar again, the same noise that I had heard numerous times with my wife earlier when we were in the woods and when I was by myself coming home prior to... Gene and I going out in the woods when I had just walked in the house before my wife showed me the scratch and all the cows went crazy. So we're getting down the road. Now this thing, he sees the gun get pointed back out, goes down on all fours and then launches back over into the woods, another 20, 25 foot. And now I can't see him because it's as dark as it is. I can still see the silhouette from down there though. So it launches back into the woods and we get back to the house. I pull in. I stop, and we sit in the vehicle for a second. I have the garage door opener in the uh, buggy, and I pull it into the garage door, and I'm staring behind me. And now I reach down, I grab my pistol, which is a uh, 357 Magnum. It's a, a five-shot revolver. It wouldn't have done anything to this creature. It got shot clear 18 feet away with a high brass slug from 12-gauge, and it just ripped its chest open. This thing didn't even care. It just pissed it off. So I've got my pistol, my hand shaking, and I've got this thing pointed out in the back. And I see Gene's got the shotgun on his side pointed out towards the back. And we watch as the garage door slowly closes. I'm waiting to see this thing's feet just show up and rip the door off. And the spot between where the door closes and the concrete's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't see it yet. I don't see it yet. And we sit there, finally closes all the way. Now, I'm thinking, I've got to get inside. My family's inside. So we shut the buggy off. I open the door. I look outside. I don't see it. I don't hear it. So we get going back in, and I get inside, and I'm looking at Gene. We're not saying anything at first. And I pop the door open, and I I said, uh, hey, I said, uh, we're back. And I didn't, I didn't know what else to say. I didn't want to say anything running inside the house like a crazed lunatic trying to explain that we were just attacked by a werewolf. That my wife's going to tell me to stop drinking. You're an idiot. I wasn't able to even explain anything, and nor did I want to, because I'm going to put the fear in my family, two girls in the house. No, I can't do that. But I did want to check to see where they were. 
and they were in the living room. And I said, can you go upstairs for a minute? I want to come up and talk to you. Grab Gianna and go up there. I, I have something that I want to discuss with you, but I want you to go up there real quick. Gene and I will be up in a minute. And uh, I close the door, and I come back out into the wood room, and I'm sitting back there, and I look at Gene, and I said, dude, what the f*** was that thing? And he said, Brandon, I, I don't know. That's not supposed to be real. I said, that that was that was a werewolf. And he said, that's, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And he's the one that had said it looked like the werewolf from Van Helsing. And I, that's when it clicked in my head. And immediately I was like, yeah, you're right. It did. That's the only thing that I could compare it to that I've ever seen. And it's only been in a movie. So how is this thing over here? I've never seen this thing before. I've been in the woods since I've been old enough to squeeze the trigger. I, I've never seen anything like this. Now my heartbeat's slowing down. I'm kind of gaining some type of sanity back. Trying to think about what this thing could have been and nothing other than, I mean, a stereotypical werewolf from a movie. So now I'm in fear that this thing's going to come into my house because it's got my scent. It's pissed. Gene blew its whole right pectoral muscle clean off its body. It's bleeding. It's mad. I don't know what's supposed to happen next. I'm trying to think, did we piss it off? I do remember... I'm trying to think if we pissed it off originally from coming in and, and all the deer running out, it was I took its food away or something. I would imagine that it eats deer. I love venison. Why wouldn't something else? I mean, let's be real here. I couldn't believe what I had just seen, and I didn't really know what else to say to Gene. All I said was, please don't say anything. After we had discussed what had happened and, and details of the thing, so we could both kind of recap on what it was that we saw i kind of said please don't say anything to carissa please don't say anything yet until we can figure out what's going on here and i said i'm gonna go inside and he said i need to get back to my house right now and i said okay i understand please give me a call when you get home i mean we only talked for about 15 minutes and just going over what we had seen and it was a very difficult conversation because it's not supposed to be real and we both we both just were completely stunned that this creature was physically standing in front of us and it had done what it had done. And the level of intelligence of this thing was beyond any tre any creature that I've ever seen. I mean, this was smarter than, than some humans that I associate with. It was intense. So I said, please call me when you get home. Well, I know that you made it home. I need to go inside and figure out what I'm going to do. And I said, please, again, please don't say anything to my wife. And he said, I won't if you don't. So I said, okay. He said, I said, let's meet up tomorrow. Call me when you get home. So he leaves. He calls me and says, I made it home. He's only about two and a half, three miles up the street. He gets home. Okay. No issues. I go upstairs and she goes, so what the hell was that? And I didn't want to tell her at first, which I have since then. I said, this is a uh, coyote issue out there and some type of dog thing. And I didn't want to lie to her, but I didn't want to put the fear of God in her as I was feeling. I would never want anybody that I care about to feel the way I was feeling. No way. It took the trust away that I had from going into the woods. I don't want anybody else to lose that love they have for being able to enjoy the outdoors. That's a terrible thing. So I said to her, it was... uh an issue with some dogs. And she goes, what do you mean? What kind of dog? Coyotes? And I said, yeah, something like that. And uh, I didn't sleep that night. And I didn't say much to my wife. But as uh, as I get up the next day and kind of get things back together, I, I said, uh, I, I finally sat down with her and, and I told her, she goes, what's going on with you? You are you're not sleeping. You're not paying attention to things. You're not doing the things that you normally do. And you haven't you know, gone to work today. I told her I didn't feel good in the morning. I didn't go to work. I hadn't slept anything. I said, uh, you know, I'm not going to work today. I'm, I'm calling in. I just, I don't feel right. And uh, I wasn't excited to get up and help cook. And, and I wasn't playing around, tinkering around with stuff and going to get the firewood and loading up in the wood stove or anything like that. I mean, I spend most of the summer cutting and splitting firewood to keep my family warm. You know, and I'm excited to be able to say that I'm the one that had done that work to be able to keep the family warm. You know, I like to be that type of man. I like to be able to do the work, see the difference I've made, you know, 
fixing the house, doing anything, electrical, windows, siding, painting even, any type of remodeling stuff. I like to know that I did that. I fixed this for my family. I kept my family warm and did this. I fed my family with the, the squirrel or the rabbit or the deer or whatever it may be or the fish that I caught, anything. So I didn't, I wasn't even doing any of that. That's my ritual to get up and throw wood in the wood stove. And she said, something's going on with you. You need to tell me the truth. What did you see in those woods the other night? And I said, okay, you're not going to believe this. And I sat down and I went through what I had told her, just as I had told you. And it scared her. I left out some details. That's for sure. But I explained to her what it was. And I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't want you going outside. I don't know what to do yet. And she said, you need to call the police. And I said, honey, the police aren't going to do anything. They're going to look at me like I'm an idiot. They're going to tell me to lay off the, the weed or something. They're going to tell me to lay off the drinks. I don't know what they're going to say. So finally, a little more time went by, and I thought, you know what? I am going to call the police. I'm going to go through, and I'm just going to let them know I've got something in the woods, some type of rabid dog. I think that's what I'll go with, I said. So I call them up, and I say, this is what's going on, to at least get them to come out. So Kewa County Sheriff shows up. It's a small town, so I know him personally. He shows up. I explain to him, you know, this is what's going on. He comes over with a couple of DEC officers. They pull in the driveway. I say, uh, hey, how you doing? And he goes, not much, Brandon. I mean, like I said, small town, first name basis. He said, what exactly is going on? And I said, can I talk to you privately for a minute, please? And he said, of course. And uh, he told the DEC guys who I've never met or seen before, you know, hang out there for a minute. And I pulled him aside and I said, listen, I had an incident with Gino the other night. And uh I sat down and explained to him, and I said, what I'm about to tell you, you got to promise me that you actually look into it and you believe me. And my reputation of I'm not a big drinker, I uh stay away from any of that type of stuff, really. I don't mind a few beers once in a while. Nothing wrong with that. But uh I like to stay in control. I like to know what's going on around me. And uh I've built my reputation on being able to be heard and, and understood and believed. And uh, this was just completely out of character for me to be able to explain, but I did. And as I'm explaining to him what it was, he believed everything and he was straightforward with me and I was straightforward with him. And everything was fine up until the point when I started explaining what this creature looked like. And I saw the blood drain out of his face, just like I did Gene's that night when we shined the spotlight on him. And as he's writing notes about what it is that took place, he stopped. And he went from comfortable to uncomfortable. And I mean real quick, Vic. He closed his little book, and he looked at me, and he said, Are you sure that's what you saw? And I said, I'm 100% positive. And he goes, uh, All right, sit tight. And he goes back to his vehicle, and he makes a phone call. And uh, he comes back, and he says, uh, I think we can have this dealt with. He said, um, I'm going to come back tomorrow and uh, we'll do something a little bit further on this. And I said, what's going to happen? You know, what do, how are we going to deal with this? And he said, I'm not sure. And it looked like he had known what it was that was going on because he obviously was familiar with a scenario that's similar to this. He called somebody. You know, I could see a look in his face. He was terrified as well. Maybe he was reliving a situation that he got into, an encounter he got into. I don't know. I can only speculate on what was going through his head, but I knew that he was familiar with what it was that I had spoke to him. So he makes the phone call. Fast forward to the next day here. Nothing else happened that night. I don't hear any more screams, nothing. Now, we get to the next day here, and uh, the sheriff pops back over. Now, he's got this van or big enclosed truck thing with him, all black. And he's got this guy with him. He pulls in in front. The other vehicle, this big bulky looking thing, pulls in behind him. And I see him on the cameras because I got cameras all around the house. And when you pull in the driveway, it's got sensors on each side so that you can hear the ding inside the house and know that someone's pulling in the driveway. And I see the cameras. I see these vehicles. And I'm like, okay, they're here back again to deal with this incident. I'm like, perfect. 
I said, I'll be back in, honey. I'm going to go handle this. So I go out. He comes out and says, uh, hey, this is uh, so-and-so. I don't even remember at the time. I was just completely distraught because his outfit looked like some type of military uniform or, or, or some type of military unit. But I'd never seen any of the badges on there. There wasn't any writing. It was just this weird symbol of a, a badge on there. It wasn't anything that I was familiar with. And uh, I shook his hand, and he said, you're Brandon? I said, yeah. And uh, he goes, run by me again exactly what had happened. So I took a couple minutes, and uh, I explained to him in general what it was that was going on. At that point, I can see he's got a pistol on his hip. And at that point, he motions over this wave or whatever. And I look over it. Now, five more of the same type of people, the same type of outfits, gets out of this black van truck thing. Now, as they get out, they all have pistols on. And they have these strapped, what looks like some type of smaller machine gun, SMG, maybe even fully automatic firearm hanging around their neck. And, I mean, these guys are some type of professionals here, some type of government professionals. I've never seen anything like this in my life, and I'm very familiar with all the military outfits and uniforms. I've never seen this. So they come out, and they come up, and he goes back over and talks to him. and now my wife's coming out, and she's going, what the hell is this? What is going on? And I said, go back inside for a minute. I'm not sure yet. And I talked to the sheriff, and I said, what's, go what's going on here? I said, what, what is this? And he goes, they'll, they'll handle it. They know what to do. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've got a lot of questions right now. I don't know who these people are. What's going to go on? Are they going on a hunt for this thing right now? That's all I can think of. They're strapped up like they're going to World War III. You know, so they come back over. He said something to them quick there. I don't know what it was. And uh, they come back over. And he has me explain the area where they went, excuse me, where I went down into the woods and as they start heading over that way, I see them. They have this, one of them has this, it looks like a satellite disc with a smaller satellite disc in the middle. The wider one's about a foot and a half long. The other one that's inside of that one, the other cone part, is only about five, maybe four inches long. So I'm looking at this thing, and I'm thinking, what is that little device? Maybe a loudspeaker or something. What are they going to do? Yell for this thing in the woods? Or maybe... They're going to yell to each other. I don't know. But as soon as he puts it out in front of him, I'm in the middle of a conversation that I can't even tell you what it was about at the moment now that I come back and think of it. But I, I was just so distracted because he points this thing out in front of him. It looks like a, it's got a hand grip and a trigger on it. And he hits this thing. And my dog, I've got a year-old pit bull, about 90 pounds, big girl, Maya. Very healthy. Never had any problems with her. Spent a lot of time with her in and out of the woods. She's trained like you wouldn't believe. Never have any issues. I look over and I see her quizzed up in a ball, shaking like she's having a seizure. I don't know what's going on with her. She's whimpering and crying and screaming. She can't even get up. And I'm thinking, hey, whoa, 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 what's going on here? What, what, why is my dog doing this? And as soon as I had yelled over to that, they had this thing sticking out in front of them, pointing towards the woods. They put it back down, and as soon as they put that device back down, Maya stood up. She stopped doing the seizure thing and crying, and she came right over to me and sat next to me. She was scared, nervous. I didn't know what happened. I'm sure she didn't know what the hell happened to her. And I'm yelling over, hey, what, what was that? What is that thing? What are you guys doing right now? And he said, we'll be back up shortly to have a conversation with you in a minute. And I'm looking over at the sheriff, and I'm shaking my head with wide eyes like, what the hell is going on here, man? What, what was this? Did you just see what this did to my dog? So they go out, and they come back a couple hours later, maybe two two to three and a half hours later. Now, the sheriff's gone at this point. He told me basically that I was in good hands, and they'll take care of it. But he never really discusses anything or reveals any information about this creature that he's familiar with or, or, or anything. It's kind of a quick high and by, I'm handing this off to them. Now, these got to be some type of government people because I've never seen this outfit, as I said before, and they had some type of devices and, and things that I've never, I'm not familiar with. 
it did something, some type of sound wave or some type of energy that came out of that thing that put my dog into a mess. I didn't hear it and I didn't feel it. Must be something only that animals or dogs can hear. I'm not sure. I'm speculating on that. So they come back about three and a half, three hours later, and uh, they knock on the door. I see them walking back up in the cameras because originally when they had gone to leave, they jumped back in the vehicle. After they pointed that thing out into the woods, they went back in the vehicle and they drove it down the dirt road. So they come back. I see them pulling back up, and I said, uh, so what's going on here? What did we figure out, guys? And the other four are over in the woods. They got a couple bags with them, I see, too. So they're over near their van. And I'm talking to this guy, and I said, well, what outfit are you guys with? And he ignored my question, and he said, i got to ask you a couple questions. And I said, okay. So we ran through some things, and a couple of these questions that he asked were, did you take any pictures that day? And I said, no, it was the middle of the night, pretty much. It was 8.30, 9.30 at night. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yes, I am. And he goes, okay. And uh, before he had left, he had asked about the deer cams and things before they had went in the woods, and I told him that I got about 30 out there. And uh, he goes, okay. So we went through a conversation of asking if I had what I had come to realize, any physical proof of this creature, which he obviously didn't want me to have. And, you know, I'm no dummy here. I could see that they were looking to see if there was any type of proof of anything, and they wanted it in their possession. Now, come to find out, they go to leave. They say that they'll talk to me, you know, shortly. We'll make sure that we get in contact with you. As for right now, you should be all set. And I said, what does that mean, all set? I have a lot of questions here. I need to know what it is that's going on, and I need to know right now. I'm concerned about my well-being, my family's well-being, and all of my free time <laughs> is spent in the woods. I, I can't even go back in there right now unless I know what it is that's going on. I, I don't know. High-powered rifles, pistols, and shotguns. Black powder, that's all I got in this gun safe. I don't know what I'm supposed to do to keep myself safe to go out there. You know, I need some answers. And he said, we need to look a little further into this, and we'll get back in touch with you. For right now, you're all right. Just sit tight. And I said, okay, I don't know what that means, but I'm trying to get more out of him. He won't give it to me. So he goes to leave. As he leaves, I'm trying to look at the license plate. I'm trying to see if I got it on camera. I can't see the license plate. It has some tent thing. There is a license plate. It is a New York license plate, and I can't make it out. I tried to look on the cameras. Couldn't make it out. I want to know who these guys are and what it is that's going on. They're obviously on my team, but they're hiding something. Because to ask if I had anything, if I have this, I have that, you know, they want a possession of it. So next couple of days, I get the courage to go out. And I end up going out there all strapped up like some type of army vet. I get out there, and there's a couple of the deer cams that I've got next to the edge of the woods. Now, I can see the dogs going back outside. I can see over the next day that the cows are back up next to the edge of the woods. And I'm thinking, okay, I feel a little bit safer. And obviously, daylight, because you can see what your surroundings are, you feel a little bit safer. It's important to always be aware of your surroundings, especially with finding out that there's more creatures than you originally knew were on this planet. So I get out. There's a couple deer cams close to the line of the uh, edge of the field and the head drawn. I don't want to go too deep in there. I'm not ready for that yet. But I pop a couple of them open, and wouldn't you know it, all the SD cards are gone. Every one that I had checked on the edge of the woods. Now, I have to check the other 20-something, but I can bet you any amount of money Okay, I'll bet you my favorite fishing pole that all of them are gone to. There is no way that they said to me, do you have any deer cams? How many? And all of a sudden, all the SD cards are gone. Let's get real here, guy. There's no way. So they're going to review all those, see if they captured anything. And I wish I would have known at the time because I would have pulled them. I don't know if I would have been able to get deep into the woods to get all those. But I would have pulled as many as I could to see what I had on there. Because it did come to mind, but they beat me to it. So I'm still waiting to hear back from them. And uh, at this point in time, this was less than a month ago. It would be a month ago, March 2nd, which is 
coincidentally my birthday, but I'm hoping now that it's been a month that I haven't had any other issues. I haven't heard any of that screaming. The cattle is back to its normal routine throughout the day. And I'm hoping uh, that this will continue and I can continue to move forward with being able to gain my love back for the woods and lose a lot of this fear because that is my favorite place to be. But I'll tell you from what I saw last month, anything is possible at this point. I like to remain open-minded and remain teachable. And that was a very humbling experience because I didn't realize that something like that would grow and something like that would actually exist. This thing was ready to take anything on and it was bigger than any creature I've ever seen. It it was just beyond imaginable. And to think that I have my family there and I'm completely helpless, I thought about moving them. we got to get out of here, I'm thinking. And then I'm thinking to myself, there's no way that I'm going to let this thing push me away from my house. I've worked really hard to have what I have at 30 years old. There is no way I'm letting this thing beat me. But over the next week or so, I couldn't sleep well. I was not focusing on things. All I could keep thinking is I'm going to see this thing through my window one day and it's going to blast through and it's going to take my family. It's going to, I don't know what it's capable of. I have no clue what it's capable of, but whatever created this thing, I don't know what it was thinking. This thing is just a damage machine. It is ready all the time to just go from zero to a hundred in full attack mode. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about it, but I know for sure that I definitely am not going to be going back in the woods anytime soon. And that's a sad thing because it's taken something from me, Vic. It's taken my ability to be comfortable and be able to enjoy the woods and share the outdoor experiences with my family and friends and ones that I care about, be able to create memories with those friends and family that I care about, has taken that away from me. And I'm really working hard to try to move forward with that so I can hopefully one day get that back. And that's, that's pretty much it. Well, it goes without saying, I am so sorry you had to deal with such a nightmarish encounter like that. That is horrible. But having said that, I've got a laundry list of questions I want to ask you about that experience, but we're about out of time. Before we get out of here, I do have one question I want to ask you, though, and that is, you told me in the pre-interview that it seemed like that dogman was running next to your side-by-side -side for an eternity, but if you think about it, how long do you think he really was next to you? Well, we were about two miles in the woods. As it got shot, it jumped up across the road. And then at some point it had moved up next to me right as I turned around. I didn't know how long it was next to me, but if I'm thinking back, I would say it was running next to our vehicle from the time I turned around to right when I got almost to the road up until Gene pointed the gun to it and it realized it was a gun and stopped, which was only about 500 yards before we hit the road. I would say at 45, 50 miles an hour, maybe 20 seconds, not even 20 seconds, but it felt like it was way longer than that. Trying to be able to identify what this creature is up close, all I could focus on was its teeth and its, this long snout and its ears and, and being able to see its haunches bend backwards like that, like a dog, and, and how ripped its abs were and all the muscles through its hair that I could see. And this thing, I just, I can't explain the smell, Vic. I could, it just smelled like garbage of a wet dog that had been rolling around in trash. It just, it stunk. It was a foul smell. It was two feet away from me. And the smell was just coming through my window. It was disgusting. It didn't bother me at the time, but I, I definitely, if I smelled that again, I would know that is a very distinct smell. It's not just a wet dog smell. It's something else. I mean, this thing was horrific. It it was so bad. I just, all I could focus on was the chomping. Just, I remember, man, those, I'll tell you, 
those teeth. That's that's I keep seeing its face. Just a boom, 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 boom. Its teeth coming down, and how sharp they were, you know. And, and they weren't wasn't like you know they were pink stained with blood. They were bright white, Vic. Bright white, and these things were sharp. It just had yeah, it had to have been about twenty seconds. About twenty seconds, uh, maybe fifteen, would. Uh, as it put its hand up onto the front of the vehicle to try to slow us down. Five seconds went by, and then maybe 15 as it reached up and tried to slow our vehicle down and kind of pull, hold it back while we were driving. When you've got a monstrosity like that just two feet away from you, I'm sure it did feel like an eternity. Absolutely. Yeah, that's not a good situation. Before we started tonight's show, you had already agreed to come back next week and answer all the questions I've got for you about this experience you told us about tonight, so I want to thank you for that, and also I want to thank you for coming on tonight's show and sharing that experience with us. You know, I appreciate it. Thanks, Vic. I appreciate you having me. Oh, you know you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. You too. Thanks. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.